If you consider yourself an introvert, then you've probably heard quite a few of the cliches over the years about all those many reasons why you might not make a very good leader. Well, I'm here to tell you, first of all, those reasons are usually wrong. And second of all, introversion can actually be a strength, despite what most people think and what most people will tell you. And we're going to be talking about that in some detail today, as well as the differences between introversion, extroversion, as well as ambiversion and even omniversion. So if you don't know what any of those mean, this is the episode to find out. We're going to talk about the differences between all of these ideas and concepts and ways of being and the various strengths, weaknesses and opportunities that exist when it comes to leadership, career, life and business. And to help me do that today, I'm joined by my very special guest, Tom Cleary. He is a personal development, well-being and mental health consultant, and he has loads of expertise to share on all of these subjects. So it's going to be a really good conversation. I know I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm sure that all of you will as well, listeners. This is Leading with Integrity, Leadership Talk, the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical, and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs, and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share with an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership, it's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Well, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time out of your sunny afternoon to join me today. Much appreciated. (laughs) Thank you for the invitation. Yes, it's it's breaking through the clouds a little bit right now, but not quite there. Is it? Okay, well, it's it's too hot here, if anything. So there we go. (laughs) As always, I'm going to start the episode by handing the reins over to you to introduce yourself to the listeners, tell them a bit about your background, what you do, why you do it, and and your business and what it looks like. With pleasure. Yeah. So my, I have many hats, I would say, but my main thing that I do is a mental health and well-being consultant and trainer. So I work with a lot of businesses, supporting them with uh, their workforce, making sure that they have. Uh, mental first aiders in place they understand certain topics in a really easy to access way um my route to getting there is a little bit unusual so i uh, did psychology in my original degree chose to study falling in love as my kind of um, end of year project real interest in human connection and relationships and then ran a um, d- dating agency for several years based on that so again seeing the way that human interaction was working or sometimes not working. Um, after that, I went into, which as one does, went into teaching um, after that and moved into um, quite quickly into a leadership role. And um, I was an assistant head teacher for a few years and experienced quite a phenomenal burnout um, from there. And it was that which caused me to kind of reassess what I love doing, what maybe I don't love doing so much, really love sort of coaching, mentoring people, love designing, learning, making things understandable. I was head of maths in two school and I can barely count past 10. So it was that idea behind if someone doesn't get it, how do we make that 
understandable for somebody. So yeah, retrained in mental health and well-being, which brought me to uh, what I what I do now. It's certainly a varied journey, then. <laughs> It, it is. There's, there's, a, there's a connecting thread that goes through all of them, which is um, how I help someone today. So whether it was somebody who was single originally or sometimes people actually who um, felt the social pressure to be in a relationship, didn't actually want to be. But they end up that permission of, do you know what, it's OK not to be. With teaching, originally it was obviously the kind of children and students I was supporting. And then later on it was um, the team, the teachers. I was also head of community, so it's the parents as well with that. And then with what I've been doing now, part of which has been um, partly sort of therapy and one-to-one, and then over the last few years, especially since COVID, working with quite large groups and companies, it's thinking about if I can help somebody avoid what I went through, um, that's a really big driver for me. Um I'm, I'm a massive geek, so any way that I can kind of refine what I do or bring some of my passions into my work is also a, a big part of what drives me. And uh, I mean, the experiences with burnout and I mean, the teaching profession is, let's call it underappreciated. That's probably the most polite way of saying it, isn't it? Certainly in this country. Do you it's, think that's connected to the fact that you burn out? Were you having to work too much or was there more to it? There was a lot to it, I'd say. I think there was... Um, I'll be polite to say leadership issue in the school. It wasn't just me who left when I did. And those who did had very similar experiences, including being on uh, medication, frantic anxiety and, and stress, things like that. I think it was also partly to do with um, lack of self-care. So for me, I was somebody who was working around 90 hour weeks. I was being told by friends and family that if I wasn't working, I was in zombie mode. But for me, I wanted to really look after the children, the staff, the parents, and my own well-being came, it wasn't even on my list, it wasn't just low down, it wasn't on the list at all. Um, and yes, I, I, I have a lot of clients who are schools and colleges and universities who I hear very similar things. But there are good, there are good schools out there. It's been nice to meet some um, CEOs of Academy Trusts and some head teachers in the last few years who put staff well-being so strongly at the kind of forefront of what they do that they are attracting and they are retaining some fantastic staff where some schools I know are struggling to recruit um, or to keep people for more than a year or so sometimes. Yes, it is an interesting thing, particularly the self-care piece. And I think, you know, there's there's a lot of leaders out there who go too far the other way and it's, it's me first and forget everyone else. But then it, equally, you know, it's you, if you put everyone else before yourself all the time, then what state are you going to be in for leadership? And a few people I speak to about this, like the, the aeroplane oxygen mask analogy comes yep. out, doesn't it? You, you, there's a reason you have to put your own mask on first. But I think that the right answer is is somewhere between the two, isn't it? it? You've got to do enough of looking after yourself that you don't fall down and die or whatever. But also you've still got to put the team first a lot of the time because that's part of being a leader, in my opinion. Anyway. I, I think I disagree slightly with that. Oh. And, I, and I used to, um, I'd gone from one extreme to the other, I suppose, because I was very much, I'll put them first. And then what happened was, which I still feel guilty about, I walked out of school one day and I physically and mentally could not function. And at that point, I was somebody who, um, if I were ever away from school, from my team, this huge guilt of someone else taking my workload on, having to, to support each other, etc. And having seen what happens when you don't put yourself first. Um, and I work with a lot of leaders and managers on this, where there is this thing about yeah, it's important I look after myself, but the team is actually still above me. Um, the number of people who later on down the line I've worked with who have then gone through burnout, who then haven't been able to look after their team. So I, I go the other way now where it's trying to train people not to think of it as being at all selfish by, by doing that, because in order to be there for their team, they have to have that. So it's not even just the bare minimum. It's, it's making sure that we are doing all those things for us in order to be there for family, for friends, but also in order to be not just physically there, but mentally on our game with our teams as well. So, but there's different ways of saying it. No, I, I see where you're coming from. I guess it's it's the means to the end, isn't it? If the end is looking after the team, the means is looking after yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I 
I don't disagree with you. I think you're right. It's in it's in terminology, isn't it? Again, it always it, is. It's always a language. It's always a tricky thing, language. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So, speaking of terminology, yes. I know as well a lot of the work you do today is working with introverts, and so I thought the well, best place to start on that subject is let's define the terminology. So, what do we actually mean by introvert, extrovert, and ambivert, and what are the key differences between those three? I love this question. And yes, so over the years, I've ended up um, refining what I do. And I do a lot of um, work in social well-being. So again, going back to that original degree, it's human relationships and how it impacts us. And I kept looking at the clients who were being described as being very introverted, either as a one-to-one or as an entire firm. But what each person meant by that was completely different. So I thought, this is interesting. What's going on here? And I'd always use the term introvert for myself. I like that term. I've embraced it for a very long time. I've never felt a need really to be an extrovert. So I started doing some research into it and asking people who had any form of, um, that they linked in some way to the word introvert, whatever it meant to them. And I would ask them what a definition was, whether it's good or bad, lots of different sort of questions in an interview format. And um, came away going, right, we really have got this uh, situation where each person's got this really strong concept of what it means to them, but there's no real consensus. And even in psychology, there are arguments and debates over what this looks like. So one of the reasons I work in the space is in order to um, think about there not being one set definition, but that the definitions around it are really important. And the ones I tend to go with is that introversion is normally people who are more inward looking. So their focus is on an internal world. Extroverts are more outward looking. And even with saying that, it's thinking about it rather than being, which is what it normally happens, being sort of two camps, you either are this or that, there being a spectrum where people sit somewhere along there. A lot of people sitting in the middle, which is ambiversion. So if they want to call themselves an ambivert, they often will do it in that bit there where we lean towards being more outward focused, inward focused, depending on the situation and context. And then some people will be much more heavily towards extroversion or introversion. And there are multiple scales and tests you can do. I tend to score mid nineties for introversion, which is quite unusual. It's quite a high one in there. So they're focused on. Where do we kind of pay attention to? But also things like where do we derive our energy from as well? So one of the biggest ones that's been used over the last few years is um, almost becoming a cliche now, but it is still used a lot. It's where do you get your energy from? Are you energized with being around people, in which case more extroversion? If you need to take a break and do what I do with booking non-people time into my diary after I've been doing people time, then more likely to be introversion. And then there's research on um, our sensitivity to risk and reward, things like that. But the, the simplest way I think of looking at it is that we have a different form of focus. I'm very much inward looking. Um, I've got friends who are very high scoring extroversion, very outward looking, and Amber Burt's somewhere in the middle. And there's one other one, actually, which um, I, I will mention, which is Omnivert, which I'm always in two minds about this, which is fitting for it, because in theory, um, ambiversion is a very healthy balance between introversion and extroversion. The way that omnivert is often used is when someone swings very strongly to strong extroversion and strong introversion, which I have a few theories about, but um, if you see that word, that's what that one means as well. How is it different? To an amb- is it because it's less situational and, or more extreme? It's more extreme. So you'd normally see an ambivert as being um, quite a healthy, well-functioning mix of those different ways of, of doing things. Whereas you might get, and again, this is why I don't, it's a much less used term, but I've seen it being used more in the last mm, two years, maybe. Describe people where they might become extremely um, extroverted in a situation which doesn't actually work for them that well, and then very introverted when they might need to be more outgoing. So it's it's a big swing between those two and tends to mean that somebody 
um, doesn't get the best out of both worlds, whereas ambiverts are seen to get the best out of both sides of things. But again, there's arguments on definitions and things like that with that one. Yeah, I, I must say, I find the whole differences and, and, that, and ha- having it on a spectrum, I really like as well. Because, I mean, there's so many arguments around leadership, which we'll probably talk about a bit later when, when it comes to the introvert, extrovert kind of spectrum, let's call it, because I do like it. Because it is, it is shades of grey as, as, as individual people are, you know, no one's a, a one or the other. Um, but I think back to like my earliest exposures to leadership, you know, back 15, 20 years ago back then a leader was the classic extrovert they were the outgoing the approach anyone no matter how well they know them have the conversation they were the kind of the the big confident public speaker the the loud presence if you will and that always sat badly with me because naturally that's not who i am i'm nowhere near as high as you on the introvert score but it, it never sat well with me that leadership was about putting yourself out there and shouting all the time and you know but at the time that was what leadership was understood to mean, at least in the context where I was experiencing it. And so I didn't really understand why it didn't sit well. Whereas now I can look back and go, oh, well, obviously, that's why. <laughs> yeah, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> it's such a big one, that, because it, it is beginning to change. But two of the biggest places where this happens is leadership and politics, where the idea behind the type of person who's going to be successful is really outgoing, really sociable. Um, and tends to be extroverted. And again, the language lumps into two categories. Either you are extrovert and a great leader, or potentially, or introvert and unable to do that. None of that's true. You have some fantastic and extremely successful business leaders out there who identify as being very introverted. And there are pros and cons to both of those things. But in society, the workplace does tend to reward extroversion by far. Oh yeah, definitely. I, I, and as you were speaking there, another one's just occurred to me, which is the, the whole entrepreneur ethos. But then if you look at some of the most successful ones, I mean, Bill Gates, I don't think anyone would really describe him as an extrovert, would they? I mean, clearly one of the most successful business people and entrepreneurs of all time. So, And most of them are. Most of the ones yeah. who are in that sort of top, top, top percentage of being successful in terms of either world impact or just growing enormous businesses and money, identify as being very introverted. Um, it's a really common theme, but then you've also got a lot of those coming from tech backgrounds. And again, I have a lot of tech um, companies and they tend to attract people who are a little bit more introverted. So I wonder whether there's an element of because of the business that they come from, whether it's to do with uh, Microsoft or Apple or whatever it might be, whether or not that also skews towards introverts being successful at that level of business possible. I'm trying to avoid making horribly unfair generalizations. Um, or allowing the chip on my shoulder to come out too much. But I, I think it's because introverts or people on the introverted side of the spectrum are more able to grasp things like the detail. They're better able to listen, to make those personal connections with people. And I think that, first of all, it makes them better leaders. But secondly, in the tech fields, those are the things that your success will hinge upon. It's, it's leveraging the detail. It's understanding how things work and taking the time to pay attention to that. Whereas, again, don't want to make unfair generalizations, but certainly extroverts that I've worked with in the past don't care about any of that stuff. It's just about who's who's the seen to be the leading presence, whether or not they actually are achieving anything. There is research on that. I again, it's it's what I, I so to give you a comparison. Um, so we June has, has been a big thing about men's health. And we talk about men um, because we don't do it as often as we should do, we think of it as being a quite, a quite sort of niche group. It's not. It's a really, really huge, diverse group. We talk about um, introverts and extroverts. It's extremely diverse. So whenever I talk about them, I'm always wary about making those sweeping statements. But there is also something behind that where um, people who are more heavily towards the introverted side of things are more likely to um, enjoy spending time alone, to focus on detail, to get absorbed in certain topics, to form very deep relationships with a fewer number of, of people, um, to see things in a way because of the inward reflection that um, extroverted people don't tend to as much. And yet we tend to um, celebrate much more the things which come naturally to to extroverts. But I say both both ends of a spectrum and everyone in the middle has personal pros and cons to it but it's it's a shame that society is such a long time i mean you see the negatives of introversion and the positive of extroversion which is not 
how it should be at all. Yeah, it is interesting where that divide falls when it comes to gender as well and, and how that fits into the whole workplace roles historically. And yeah, I mean, you can make all sorts of sweeping assumptions there, can you? <laughs> you really can, yes. And um, it's one of the weird things about my job is to make some sweeping statements because it makes a constant need to understand while also saying, but don't listen to that because each person's individual and we all have our own strengths and weaknesses. And it's one of those things where, as with labels, um, I'm a big believer in that sometimes labels and boxes are really helpful in understanding ourselves or other people getting support, things like that. At other times, they're really restrictive and they prevent growth. So I think it's a case of balancing when is a label or a sweeping statement useful to us or to our teams? And when does it actually hold us back a little bit as well? Definitely, definitely. I, I, I kind of see it as understanding the theory versus interpreting in practice, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, and, and you're right. I mean, things like labels and the generalizations and our sweeping statements, all of that, that's really useful kind of academically to understand it as a concept, as long as we don't fall into the trap of then equating that to reality and trying to fit everyone into that little box so that we understand it in our own minds. And also with those boxes, we tend to have an us versus them mentality. So we've historically had society, I said, which celebrates extroversion, but as introversion has grown, it's been called the quiet revolution the past few years. What you tend to see if you follow those kind of tags on social media is you, you see introversion being celebrated by pulling down extroversion. And I'm very anti that because I don't think we should be pulling people down. I think we should be recognizing different people's strengths, depending on where on that spectrum they might be and different factors that they have in their lives as well. But then wherever you fall going, there are certain things I'm good at and certain things I need to develop. And actually, I've got a lot of clients who are very extroverted who are beginning to learn that there are certain things that come easily to more introverted people that they need to work on. The same way that we always sort of think about introverted people needing to work on, you know, public speaking or things like that. But there are, it goes both ways. Yes, you're right. And I wonder as well, actually, how much of the, the dragging extroverts down is due to some of our, as introverts, bad experiences. Because you're right, it, it, it becomes us versus them. And, and I don't, I don't think that's the right way to go either. No, and I know some really supportive people who are very much wanting to understand introversion better and, and support that, who are themselves very highly extroverted. Um, I know some people who are very introverted who, you know, they, they might not lack, they might lack a few qualities which perhaps they could do within the business, in the business world. So it's not the one's better than the other. And I, I think it's really important that we, um, I, even the people who I know understand that, who see it as being a spectrum, who know the sort of nuance behind it, will still fall into the us and them thing. It feels safer sometimes, I think, to have that's my tribe, that's who I identify with, therefore that's what I'll protect. But then that doesn't help in the business world. And I've seen it happen really badly recently with a client who had a, a very large uh, team who were very outgoing, very sociable, very extroverted, taking over a smaller business who were very introverted and I couldn't see why there was a huge clash in terms of um, development days, away days, social interactions, because the cultures were so different. Um, they're now starting to sort of take pros and cons from both and make things flexible for people. And I think that's really the key of it, isn't it, is understanding the context, as you said earlier, and making sure that your approach fits that context, uh, which is, that's part of leadership again, isn't it? That's, <laughs> that's what we're there to do as leaders in well, I hope the good ones. That's <laughs> what we should be there to do as leaders. There we go. Corrected. <laughs> so we might have already covered some of the next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, just to see what happens. What are some of the assumptions that people make about introversion that you would like to challenge? <laughs> so many. Um, so you tend to have introversion linked into um, shyness and social anxiety, which are very different things. And while you can have introverts who are very shy, or anxious socially, you can have extroverts who are the same as well. But this this idea that introverts are antisocial, that we don't like people, that we are slow thinkers or quiet in meetings or haven't got things to contribute, that's what I hear quite a lot. But shyness is a very different thing from introversion. Um, and they can, they can correlate, but they can happen to anyone at all. It's the preferences. So if somebody, um, extroversion, so thinking about um, external focus, one of the 
cliches that you might hear, which has some basis in truth, is that if someone's quite extroverted, they will think and process out loud, which works really well in something like a brainstorming meeting in a business. Whereas a lot of people who are more introverted need to have internal reflection time, I call it percolation time, where we are kind of sitting with an idea and coming up with things. But if you're sat there in a meeting doing that and you're not directly talking and being involved, it's seen as being either a slow thinker, can't make decisions, doesn't contribute to things. And it's not the case at all. It's completely different styles. The workplace is celebrating. So I'd like to break that connection between introverts are shy, that we hate people. I know some extroverts who actually aren't keen on people. They need people to kind of give them energy. I know introverts who absolutely love people, but just need to have some recharge time alone afterwards. So just challenging that kind of internal idea we've got of what that sort of thing looks like is really important. I think it depends on the people. I'm bound to say that, you know, I mean, a certain group of people, you know, that might energise me, uh, whereas another might make me run for the hills. So <laughs> it, it, it does make a difference to context. There mm-hmm. is some research that um, even if you are with people, if you score quite highly on introversion and you are with people, you actually love spending time. So a client of mine said to me last year, he said, um, one of my favourite times of year is Christmas and being with my family. But despite that, they know at a certain point during the day, I have to go to my room and go for a walk by myself. Otherwise, I actually get quite stressed and I get quite, um, I'm not the best company with things. So there's times when even the people that we we love or energize us actually, um, it's sometimes to do with being quite sensitive to picking up cues, reading a room, absorbing so much information. The system goes, ah, Kate, need a break from that. Let's come back to it. But it's definitely groups in my life who will drain me far quicker <laughs> than other ones will. Yes, yeah, especially when there's alcohol involved, I find. But yeah, anyway, that's best, best not so much about that. Um, do, do you think that's partly because of what we were talking about earlier with the attention to detail? And when you're, when you're so detail-focused, the more information there is available, the more happening, the more to take in, the quicker you can kind of overload on that that's one of the main theories. So I remember being at uni years and years and years ago when one of my lecturers was looking at the um, sensitivity of the nervous system and how um, introverts will reach that kind of, okay, I've had enough now, I feel like I've got what I need to much more quickly than an extrovert will do. So part of that can be from paying a lot of attention to detail, to tone of voice, to um, wording, um, nonverbal communication, and with that amount of information coming in, that can lead very quickly to that. But there are other theories about um, chemicals that are produced by things like risk and reward taking. Um, but yeah, one of the key ones is because we absorb and we notice a lot of information, um, we get full <laughs> quite quickly. That's interesting about risk as well. So would you, would you say that introverts have a lower appetite for risk generally or... That's the theory, and that's the one which is becoming explored more and more. So the one that, that's, that's been around for ages is that kind of social battery one. But the one which is being looked at increasingly is um, sensitivity to risk. The idea being that um, if an extrovert takes a risk and it pays off, their reward is actually really strong and much more than it is for an introvert. So an extrovert's more likely to take risks out there because they, if it goes right, they'll get a huge boost from that introvert because there'll be things where it's like well is it worth doing this but is it worth being around loads of people is it worth it for me even if it pays off there's been so much expense paid already that actually it often isn't worth it for people so there tends to be a and it's being explored but possibly some risk aversion that is interesting yeah i, I think that there's something to be said about the the quality of the risk as well isn't there and the risk and well versus reward but also versus what happens if it goes wrong <laughs> <laughs> yes and and the goes wrong bit's interesting because again if you if you have got people like i'm going back into that kind of each end of a spectrum thing but if you've got somebody who's quite extroverted and that their um focus is external they're less likely to sit there ruminating on things than somebody who's very introverted whose focus is internal where they can get stuck on an experience and really pick it to pieces there's often a lot of um critical voice going on as well with introversion so get inward looking um there's more time alone often as well which gives more time to reflect and ruminate etc so the unpicking thing 
um, tends to link into it as well. I mean, the, the connotations for business are quite interesting as well, I think. Um, try not to be too biased by my own experiences again, but it's, you think back to some of the big personality, in inverted commas, extroverted I mean, there's a particularly relevant example that's been in the news um, and their attitude towards risk and focusing on the potential reward and not thinking about the the risk of failure or what would happen if that failure does occur. And when you think about that in a business setting, I mean, maybe, obviously, actually, I think the answer is you need to have both of those perspectives in your decision making. You've got to have the, whether it's the extrovert or the ambivert or the omnivert, perhaps, who knows, <laughs> um, that person who's looking at, well, this is a potential reward, but then you also need to have the person there who's also balancing that against the risk, the likelihood of that risk, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but, yeah, it's a very interesting field, that. The best teams I've been on have had that combination. And I remember my first leadership role had somebody in the team who, irrelevant of almost extroversion, introversion, they were extremely good at seeing any possible problem as a new leader, it made me really frustrated. It took me probably a year to go, oh, hold on. We've avoided so many issues because they've been able to pick out what goes wrong. But at the time, it was like, we've got a great new idea. We're all behind it. And then this person came in and goes, yeah, but that will go wrong. It's like, oh, thanks. But they often had a point. So I do think the mixture of viewpoints and the mixture of kind of risk reward, safety seeking, et cetera, is so important but we, we miss it a lot because we don't value introverts in the workplace as much as we do extroverts we actually don't get as good a mix as we would otherwise i agree yeah i, I was going to say before you before you answered that one i was going to say i mean obviously there's a natural conflict there and you're always going to get that frustration i think it's one one example i think of an area in business where conflict is healthy and you want that and yeah, I mean, having been on both sides of that story myself as well, as the new leader, it is frustrating when you've got this great idea and you want to make it happen and there's someone there and it's very easy to like call them the negative Nelly or Eeyore or whatever. But really in their mind, there's maybe there's a resistance to change thing going on, but in their mind, they're trying to help. They're trying to say, well, look, these are the risks. We need to be aware of that. We need to have a strategy for if they happen and all of that side. And then I've also been on the other side of the argument where and it is an argument, let's be honest, uh, where I'm the one saying, well, no, that's not going to work because this, 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 and this. And then you see them getting frustrated with you. You're like, well, I'm sorry, but <laughs> if I don't say it now, you'll blame me later. So, <laughs> yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah, it is an interesting bit of human nature there, though, I must say. Changing tack a little bit then, let's, let's go away from my negative thought there and go on to what advantages does being an introvert offer? for getting the most out of life, out of your career, out of your business? There's loads. And it makes me quite sad that the number of people who will class themselves as an introvert or very introverted, who only look at the negatives and things that they find harder to do. But loads of research shows that, and again, this is not to say that extroverts can't do this, but there's a resistance here. If you say that an extrovert's um, often really outgoing and sociable, you don't get much pushback on that. But if you focus on an introvert's strengths, people often go, including me, oh, but extroverts can do that too. So I will acknowledge that both people can do both things. But with introversion, um, the higher down that scale, the higher you are on the introvert scale, you tend to have things like being able to form really deep connections with people. So if you've got someone who's networking, for example, a typical person who's quite highly extroverted will, um, like a butterfly, go through the entire room, make quite a lot of superficial connections but if you ask them what's the one key thing or one person they've walked away from, that can be challenging. An introvert going into that setting might speak to just two or three people. But the connections they will make through really high quality listening, through picking up on body language, understanding things, asking deep questions, there's an aversion to small talk for many people in there as well. So you go into big topics more quickly. You tend to see this a lot in leadership and in the workplace and socially where you get really deep connections going on. With leaders as well, there's research which shows that people who are more introverted will help their team shine, where actually they don't like the spotlight as much as somebody who's much more outgoing. So they are very happy to highlight the strengths of other people who then feel valued in, in the roles that they are, that they're doing. Um, there is some research on things like, um, introverts are less likely to conform to the social norm. 
So whether or not um, everyone's going along with it, and this happened to me in my, my very first teaching role when the entire staff um, we were given a thing by the head teacher and every member of staff, which was my first meeting there, was like, oh, yeah, great idea. And I was, thinking, I was sat there going, no, it's not. It's an awful idea. It's an awful idea. But I, I couldn't stop thinking. And I, I said in front of the entire team, no, I think it's a really bad idea. And they were like, oh, you can't, you can't say that. It's a really, you know, how can you say that? And the head teacher came to me afterwards and said, um, thank you for disagreeing. You're wrong. And it turned out I was. But um, yeah, thank you for doing that. But we, there is some research that because of the internal focus and very high self-awareness that introverts are quite likely to stick to their guns on whatever they they think is being done and be less easily swayed. Um, and you mentioned earlier as well this idea that um, there is some expertise attached to introversion because there's a love of detail and being absorbed very deeply into topics spending more time by themselves or immersed in a topic that they love rather than with other people doing more sociable stuff, then there's some research which shows that people who are seen as being highly expert at certain things are more likely to score highly on introversion. But that's quite controversial. But it is it is out there. Mm, not sure why that's controversial. It makes perfect sense to me. <laughs> If you if you celebrate strengths of extroversion, people are like, yeah, yeah, that's 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 absolutely true. If you celebrate of introversion, people are like, oh, that's a bit mean to extroverts because they, they can do that too. It's because most of us have been brought up in a society where we do celebrate extroversion and we apologize for introversion. So it's still getting that mindset of it's okay to go. We are really good at certain things because actually we are. Mm. Yeah. And one other point I really want to pick up on there from, from your second one about it's, it's the, it's the courage to speak truth to power, isn't it? Effectively, that's what you're talking about there. And it occurs to me that maybe one of the assumptions about introversion that we didn't, didn't mention yet is confidence and lack thereof. But actually what you've just described there, I mean, that takes more confidence, if anything, than the typical extrovert will have in a given situation. Again, I know we're making unfair generalizations. I'm going to keep apologising for this, listeners, but let's go. Um, so do you think, I mean, where does confidence sit within this spectrum? Is there a relationship there or not? Yes, um, but not the one we tend to assume. So this is why I mentioned shyness earlier, because people assume that an introvert will be um, less socially confident. And if you put me in certain situations, I am also quite a shy person, but I can also be very socially confident and outgoing. If you watch me doing my role, people think I'm very extroverted because I can speak to lots of strangers and I can speak to large groups of people um, really easily. But it, it's not the same thing as shyness. What the, the difference tends to be in context and the way that things are done. If you've got somebody who is very extroverted, who wants to um, get along with people because they require that group to actually get that recharge and to, to, to be happy, there is some more going along with that that group think. Whereas an introvert who's like, well, I'll be by myself anyway because I don't need other people to be around, is less likely to go, I don't want to annoy these people. It doesn't it doesn't matter quite as much. I used to do it in school quite a lot. It's like, well, I'll say what I think because unlike my friend who was really extroverted, if he says something that goes against the group that we're in, that's him alone at lunchtime. That's his worst nightmare. If I'm alone, I'm, I'm very happy with that. That's absolutely fine. So I think it is very much situational dependent. You do tend to get a bit less confidence in things which are public speaking, for example, or working with groups or expressing ideas with loud characters, but it's linked to various factors in it. So I think it's, it's probably accurate to say that there's different types of confidence for people who are more either introverted or extroverted. I mean, what strikes me about it is that sometimes in a, a fair few situations, I would argue it takes more confidence to sit in silence than it does. Because <laughs> that can be a nervous outlet for some people is just talking, you know, the word salad or whatever you call it, the, the other word that's probably a bit ruder. <laughs> um. <laughs> it, it, it's true. Um, and again, if you look at things like social anxiety with this, regardless of how someone sits on that introversion scale, if there's social anxiety going on, they are more likely to either completely shut down or sort of babble and go through things. But if you've got somebody who is quite confident and introverted, they are more likely to be able to sit back, not for the pressure to speak straight away, and then give quite a concise answer, unlike me. Um, whereas, again, it goes back to that thinking out loud sometimes where 
somebody who's quite extroverted will often need to to speak and refine ideas as they go. But someone's introverted will go through the ideas, get rid of some, and then go, this is what I think is worth us looking at. So that confidence to do that. But it's not, again, it's not often given space to breed in a workspace. Yeah, there's this whole in- instant gratification problem, isn't there? And they give me the answer now. Um, and I think you're right, again, you know, because society's almost geared towards, especially in business, towards the extrovert, They, in those situations, there's a lot of forgiveness, turning a blind eye to the fact that 80 to 90% of that thinking out loud process will be useless. <laughs> and it takes them probably the same amount of time to get to the same answer. It's just they're doing it verbally, whereas an introvert will be able to just sit there quietly, think it through, and then come out with the right answer at the end. Yes, and I think that there are ways of doing it with mixed groups. A lot of my groups will be very mixed. I might give people options of if you want to speak out loud, you can come over here, you can do that, and you can have that verbal debate. If you want to take a few minutes just to sit to yourself, to think, to write things down, to reflect, and then come and join the group, and then we will all share things, that's been really important. If I've got a group of people who all score, I had one company who um, I had a theory behind their sort of clients, make uh, their workforce makeup. And I said to them, you know, it's up to you what the definition is, but can you take on this side if you are more introverted to this side of more extroverted? And it was like 98% of the, the group of 200 were very much on the introvert side. So in that situation, we started using collaborative tools, which weren't necessarily in that moment. So you could access a joint workspace or a whiteboard um, online between meetings. People could contribute and be part of a group because you need to have that group thinking sometimes still. But they had their own time to do it and to give those ideas and reflect on different people. So making sure a mix of styles suits the group i think is really important yes definitely i really like that actually conscious about time i keep going off on tangents so we better move on i I could talk about that for another hour easily but (laughs) um, let's let's maybe spare the listeners for that one what advice would you have to offer to let's say an introverted manager on ways that they can really use their powers for good first of all to lean into your introversion and not assume it's a negative that needs to be fixed in some way but acknowledging that there may well be, depending on where on the spectrum you are, some things actually you're great at doing and acknowledge those things and some things that may need to have some development. And that if you're working on something, it's not because you're an introvert, it's because you're human and it's okay to have certain things which are there. But I see too often people going, oh, I have to because I'm quite an introvert and I don't think I'm good at doing that. It's because we, we all have things we're developing. In the back of my screen, my, I've got a poster saying that life begins at the edge of your comfort zone to remind me that daily I'm trying to push myself and do and do certain things, including podcasts, which a year and a half ago wouldn't have dreamed of doing. Um, and I said no to the first one who asked me and then I saw the post and went, oh, I say yes to you now. So leaning into it and acknowledging that, that development happens to everybody and challenging yourself to build on skills because it's a good thing uh, to do. And then also um, to build in that non-people or recharge time that allows you the reflection, the creativity, the space that you might need in order to bring your skills into the workplace. I've seen so many leaders who are more interested burn out because they are so tuned into their team. They spend more time with them trying to fix all the different needs of, of that group. And they again, they don't give themselves that non-people time they need to need to have. Excellent tips. Yeah. Uh, I'm the same. Like two, three years ago, pre COVID, last job, you wouldn't have got me on a webinar in a million years. You wouldn't have got me to go to London even. Whereas now, do it fairly regularly in, in every respect. And obviously the podcast as well. Yeah. But <laughs> it's easier being a host though. Oh, whoops. Trade secret there. Didn't mean to give that away. Okay. Let's talk a bit more about leadership then, a bit more specifically. So, of all the lessons you've learned in your career so far about leadership, which would you say has been the biggest? The biggest I've mentioned earlier was like looking after yourself, but nearly up there with that is being yourself while you develop. So too often I see people who are trying to do some self-development and they'll model themselves on either somebody quite famous or on their mentor or lecturer that they're learning from, and they lose the bit that makes them them. And I think... I did that at the beginning of my career, um, and when I played as a therapist as well, I started to speak in the voice of those who trained me, 
and it sounded so unnatural. So for me, it's been making sure that what we're doing is authentic while we grow, if that makes sense. Brings to mind a pretty extreme example of that, actually, from oh, decades back when I, I spent in misspent youth, maybe, maybe that's the wrong word, but a youth spent in the air cadet organization. So it's kind of, it's a youth group with, with a uniform effectively for anyone who's never heard of it. And there was this whole thing with that, particularly with leaders, because there was a, a, a leadership, there was a rank structure in it. And you had these, these situations, you go to different towns, different counties, and you would see all of the, the junior leaders were basically just clones, carbon copies of whoever had trained them. And you could spot, like if you knew the people doing the training, you could spot who had trained which, which kid. And it was, yeah, really quite worrying actually, because there's, especially when you're talking about teenagers and impressionable minds, there's no sense of self coming out of that. And I think, yes, it is a uniform youth organization. Yes, it had ties to an art branch of the armed forces. And yes, in the adult armed forces, that makes perfect sense to me because that's kind of what you want. It's about homogeneity, isn't it? And discipline, all those nice things. But for a youth group, in hindsight, it's actually quite worrying. <laughs> and you sit in schools too, where the teacher sort of models that. But I think the best times is when you get lots of role models and the children get to choose what sits well with them as well. So great point. Yeah. Indeed. It leads us maybe into the next question, which is what do you think is the biggest mistake a leader can make? Being inconsistent. Um, mm -hmm. I, all the worst ones I've ever seen. I, most of my clients and me can deal better with somebody who's consistently in a foul mood than somebody, just give you an example, than somebody who can come in one day and be extremely smiley and positive and you, know, you can do no wrong. And the next day is you know, you can do no right and not knowing. And I, I read something about six months ago that said one of the biggest complaints that people get about a bad manager is that they, the bad manager is inconsistent. You just don't know what to expect from it. So I'm not saying, you know, be grumpy all the time, but have some level of awareness where you aren't going from extreme to extreme every single day because people are on edge and we, and we have constant threats sort of systems activated in that sense. Yeah, I love consistency. Big fan of that. I, just in everything you do as a leader, whether it's just communication, even. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, I totally agree. And I've, I've worked for that kind of leader as well. That mercurial nature, and the, you never know who's actually showing up to work that morning. And you, you feel like you have whiplash, don't you, half the time? Yep, it's just, you do. Opposite question: What's been your own best experience of being led? Um, the first head teacher that I mentioned earlier, who was fearsome, um, and you know, would, could reduce you to a crumbling mess in seconds, but they were consistent. They were always, they had your best interests at heart all the time, and they always pushed you and challenged you. And I learned more in a year in that environment than in five years with a sort of bad leader. And it wasn't because they were easygoing. It wasn't because you got along with them as a person. It's because you respected them and you respected their experience, that they were fair to people as well. Sadly, she she passed away far earlier than um, she should have done. And that sounds odd, but you know what I mean. Um, because she was, she'd retired from being a head teacher and she's been training new teachers. And I just thought the impact of having that role model on new ones and future leaders would have been phenomenal. And there's not many like her around, I wouldn't say. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I think that's the, the the bit in that sentence, I think, to pull out is the amount you learned. Uh, I think that's it, isn't it? I mean, particularly in a teaching environment where I, I suppose it goes as red, doesn't it? Let's let's hope. But it's it, the ability to, to, it's not necessarily just teach your followers, but create the environment that enables them to learn. Because I think a big thing that a lot of leaders, a lot of managers get wrong when it comes to, the development of their teams is they miss that word that goes in the front of that, which is personal development. And they expect, again, it goes back to what we we're saying about creating clones of yourself. There's that in, incorrect, in my opinion, expectation that the leader decides the path of your development. And actually, I don't think that's the right way to go at all. No. And I would say that, and this is, we're talking 20 odd years ago now, and um, I still use things which inspired me because she encouraged me to do my own thing and, and do my own and break out of the kind of rules that everyone else was assuming. And I learned so much from that, that my own self-development is is led by being inspired to be independent all those years ago. 
Yeah, and I think even just at a basic level, I mean, certainly the way my brain works and most of the people that I've encountered over the years, if you're allowed to choose what you learn, you're more likely to learn because it's something you're interested in and that's why you've chosen it. Absolutely agree with that. So if you were to start your business over again, what would you do differently, if anything? I would trust my gut instinct more quickly. Um, Something I've learned over the years is when something feels not right, there's a reason for that. Whereas before I'd spend two years going, oh, I'm sure there's a reason why it's not quite right. And I wasted so much time. So going with my gut um, more. Okay. Yeah. And being a bit more uh, ruthless, perhaps, with things that don't need to be done. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. I think that that would probably factor into my answer to this question as well. I think most people would as well, actually. (laughs) We've all done it, haven't we? You stick at something because you're determined. You're like, well, I've spent this much time on it. It's going to work. I said to a client earlier about this, actually, and I said it's it's thinking about the difference. When are you uncomfortable because it's out of your comfort zone and out of your skill set? And when is because it's not right for you as a person? And we mix those two up a lot. And I've got better at distinguishing which ones are fear and which ones are, no, that doesn't sit with my value set. So that's the difference, I think. That to me sounds like the cheat code for life. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Yeah, right. Leadership Heroes. Okay, last question, my favourite question. It always is. Everyone gets this one, and I hope you've got a prepared answer, but no pressure if you don't. Uh, I call this one Leadership Heroes, and the question is, if you had to pick one person, and they can be alive or dead, past, present, real, fictitious, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership, who would that person be and why? My father. Um, So he's somebody who I've admired. He, He... pulled himself up in leadership um, very successfully and very introverted. He knew his um, strengths and weaknesses. He built a team around him which complemented him and would give people the the power and ability to be able to, to shine in their own right because everybody won from doing that. Extremely caring. He Even um, this weekend, he's getting emails from people that, you know, decades ago he mentored who were saying, because of you, this is what's happening to me now. So those deep relationships that he he created, and he's so um, modest about it. He he just doesn't acknowledge all those things. But seeing what he achieved and then how he did it and the way that he respected people, made people feel valued, um, that for me is my absolute sort of hero when it comes to leadership. I love that pick. Anytime anyone picks a family member, it's always got something extra special about it. So <laughs> thank you for sharing that story. I think, you, yeah, I mean, just in the way you've spoken about it, now, he's ticked off at least three things that I, what I would think of as the greatest of great leaders. It's the, the humility and, and the modesty piece. It's the fact that he built others up as well. And the fact that even decades later, they remember what it was like to be led by him. I mean, you can't say fairer than that, can you? No, absolutely not. <laughs> awesome. Well, Tom, it's been wonderful talking with you today. You've been an excellent guest. Thank you for your time. And the last thing is, if anyone listening would like to learn more about you or perhaps seek you out to work with you, would you like to point them towards website or podcast or book? or um, the- LinkedIn for me um, is the, the best one off for me because I can have a chat with people, find out whether it's the introvert community I run or the training that I run, whatever it might be, or do they want some free resources? I can help them just to find that. So if they search me, Tom Cleary Coaching on LinkedIn, they'll find me quite quickly um, on there. And I'm always happy to help people. Um, but thank you for inviting me on, David. Real pleasure to be on here today. Well, thanks again for being here. And I'll pop your LinkedIn address in in the episode description as well so everyone can find it easily. And listeners, I thoroughly recommend a chat with Tom. He's brilliant. Tom, thank you once again so much for your time. And what a really interesting and in-depth conversation we've just had there about introverts versus extroverts. And I know I shouldn't use the word versus there because it's not either or, as we've learned. It is a spectrum and also... They're not mutually exclusive and there shouldn't be that natural conflict that we often assume does exist. Listeners, if you would like to learn more about Tom, if you might be interested in hearing about his introvert community or working with him or just having a conversation about anything that you've heard today, I have popped his LinkedIn address in the episode description. So you can click on that, reach out to him. I'm sure he'd be very happy to hear from you. 
if you are a leader who may be struggling with confidence, whether you are an introvert or an extrovert, confidence can still be a challenge. If that does sound like you, if you're looking for some help to establish yourself as a leader and get the most out of your team, then I have the course, the community, the program for you. To learn more, your first port of call should be to visit the website, which is www.leadernotaboss.com. And that's all I've got time for today. Thank you once again for listening. I hope you'll join me again next week when I'll be speaking with another great guest, Mr. Ethan Bull. And he's founded a company that's focused on providing high capability executive assistants. So we're talking about, firstly, what an executive assistant is and what they do. And secondly, the various leadership lessons and insights that he's gained from a relatively long career working for extremely high level entrepreneurs and visionaries. There's a lot of learning there, and I hope you'll join me next week to find out more. So I'll see you then. And in the meantime, be a leader, not a boss.